Hello and welcome to Profdale's property video number 37. I'm your host, Dale Whitman. In this video, we're going to cover a couple of topics that relate to contracts for the sale of real estate. First, we'll cover the statute of frauds, and then we'll cover the related doctrine of part performance. So we can begin our discussion of the statute of frauds by seeing exactly what the statute's wording is. What we're going to show you here is typical, although a few states have variations on it. Usually the statute says no action may be brought to enforce a contract for the sale of real property unless the contract or some memorandum thereof is made in writing. And it also has to be signed by the party to be charged or by the authorized agent of that party. So who do we mean when we say the party to be charged has to sign the writing? Well, the party to be charged is the person against whom enforcement of the contract is sought. In other words, the person who is resisting enforcement of the contract. Normally, that's the defendant in a suit to enforce the contract of sale. Now, there are all sorts of incorrect ideas, misconceptions, really, floating around about the statute of frauds. And I'm going to show you a few of them and explain why they're incorrect. The first one is many people believe the statute of frauds requires that, that a contract of sale of real property has to be in writing. But that's not correct. What the statute really says is that either the contract of sale itself or some memorandum thereof has to be in writing. So what that tells us is that the writing doesn't have to be the contract of sale itself. It can be some other writing as long as it meets the demands of the statute of frauds. We'll see some examples of that in a few minutes. A second misconception is that the statute requires the seller to sign the writing. That's not correct. The statute says the party to be charged has to sign the writing. That might be the seller and it might be the buyer. It depends on which party is resisting enforcement of the contract, doesn't want it enforced against them. It could be either one of the parties. Third, many people believe that if one party can enforce the contract, so can the other. That sometimes is called the idea of mutuality of remedy, but it's not correct. It's quite possible that one party might sign the writing and another party might not. So the party who signed can have the contract enforced against him or her, while the party who didn't sign cannot have the contract enforced against him or her. So it's not at all true that both parties can necessarily enforce the contract against one another. It's usually assumed that the writing will be introduced into evidence in any action brought to enforce the contract. Well, that may be the practice, but it isn't legally obligatory. The statute of frauds allows us to introduce evidence that the writing existed, even if it's been lost or mislaid or destroyed, so that as long as we have evidence that there was a writing that satisfied the statute of frauds, it doesn't actually have to be introduced itself as evidence in a lawsuit. Many people suppose that the statute requires that all the necessary information about the contract be in a single writing. But in fact, the statute of frauds allows us to use multiple writings, as many as three or four or five different pieces of paper, as long as they all relate to the same transaction, we can use them all together in order to meet the demands of the statute of frauds. Finally, does the writing have to contain all the terms of the contract? Not at all. Only a minimal list of terms has to be shown by the writing. The rest of the terms may be part of an oral agreement. It's also widely assumed that if the statute isn't satisfied, the contract is null and void. But that isn't correct. In fact, the contract still has great significance even if the statute isn't satisfied. First of all, if the statute isn't met and the contract's unenforceable, the purchaser may still get rescission of the contract and restitution of any earnest money that the purchaser has paid. So to that extent, the contract is quite important even though it isn't being enforced. The other reason that this contract isn't necessarily null and void is because of the part performance doctrine. That's a doctrine that we'll study in a few minutes, 
that permits enforcement of the contract even with no writing whatsoever. So since the writing doesn't have to contain all the terms of the contract, what are the required elements of the writing? Well, first of all, it does have to identify the parties, who is the buyer and who is the seller. Second, it's got to identify the land. Ideally, there will be a complete legal description, but the courts are often willing to take a much more informal identification of the land instead. Still, we have to say something about what land is being transferred here. Third, there must be some words indicating that a sale is intended. Words like, I agree to buy or I agree to sell. Finally, as we've already said, we have to have the signature of the party to be charged. Now, in many states, probably most states, we also need to say what the price being paid for the property is going to be. And if the price is not to be paid in all cash, but instead is to be paid in installments, we need to say what the terms of the payment are. For example, how much will be paid per month, how many months it will be paid over, and perhaps what interest rate will accrue on the unpaid balance of the purchase price. Now the writing, as we've already said, doesn't necessarily have to be the contract itself. It could be some notes on a yellow pad, a letter to somebody's mother, scribbles on a restaurant menu, a memorandum written to the file, a text or an email describing the contract. And as we've already said, multiple writings may be combined as long as there's evidence that they relate to the same transaction. Now, even without any writing at all, the contract might be enforced under the doctrine of part performance. Part performance required certain acts of the purchaser and traditionally at least two of the following three acts are required in most states. First, the purchaser needs to make partial payment of the purchase price. Usually, that's in the form of earnest money. The purchaser may pays some money to the seller at the time the contract is entered into, and that'll satisfy that element of the part performance doctrine. Second, the purchaser might take possession of the real estate prior to the closing. They might do that because they need a place to live or because they want to make modifications or renovations to the property. Third, the purchaser might make some valuable improvements to the property prior to the closing. Now, as I said, traditionally, most courts said you had to do at least two of those three acts in order to satisfy the part performance doctrine. Notice that all three of these are acts of a purchaser. They are not acts that a vendor, a seller, could possibly do. However, the restatement second of contracts broadens the definition of part performance and allows us to consider other acts and acts that are performed either by the purchaser or the vendor. So they make quite a liberalization of the doctrine of part performance. Let's take a look at that restatement provision. So here's the wording of restatement of contract second, section 129. A contract for the transfer of an interest in land may be specifically enforced, notwithstanding failure to comply with the statute of frauds. If it's established that the party seeking enforcement in reasonable reliance on the contract and on the continuing assent of the party against whom enforcement is sought, has so changed his position that injustice can be avoided only by specific performance. Now let's take a look at what changes the restatement makes in the common law doctrine of part performance. First of all, you'll notice it says a party. So either a vendor or a purchaser could enforce a contract under the part performance doctrine as the restatement views it. Second, it doesn't list specific acts of reliance, but instead just says acts of reliance. So acts other than the big three that we talked about before, namely payment, possession, and improvements might count as well. And in fact, it's not hard to think of other kinds of acts that would show that sort of reliance. Possibly only one act of reliance is needed. You remember under the traditional view of part performance, one had to show two of the three big acts, that is payment, possession, and improvements. 
but maybe under the restatement, just a single act of reliance would work. Finally, enforcement does have to be by specific performance and not by damages. By the way, that's probably the common law rule as well. The part performance doctrine was invented by the equity courts and therefore probably in nearly all states can be enforced only by the equitable action of specific performance. By the way, I don't think there's any good reason for that limitation at all, but it's still something that we have to live with. So what's the theoretical basis for the doctrine of part performance? Well, classically, there are two theories that are used to explain why we have such a doctrine. The first one is a reliance or estoppel theory. That is, someone believes they have a contract to buy or sell some real estate, and the doctrine of part performance is designed to allow them to fulfill their expectations if they've relied upon those expectations. In other words, to prevent unjust enrichment by allowing one of the parties to wiggle out of the contract when the other party was relying on it. It's classically an estoppel kind of theory. The second theory is an evidentiary theory. That is, the acts of the parties are a substitute for the evidence that a writing would provide. A writing compliance with the statute of frauds is the best evidence that there was a contract, but if we don't have a writing, the acts of part performance may be good enough evidence that we should go ahead and enforce the contract anyway. Now, if you think about the restatement language that we just read, you might ask yourself, which of these theories does the restatement adopt? And the answer is quite clear when you read the restatement's language closely. It says, the party seeking enforcement has so changed his position that injustice can be avoided only by enforcing the contract. Well, that idea of changing your position is the concept of reliance or estoppel. Reliance upon someone else's representations that they're going to buy or sell this real estate with you, and you, in turn, are changing your position in reliance on that belief, and therefore the contract becomes enforceable even without a writing. So the restatement really adopts the reliance or estoppel principle. So does the existence of the part performance doctrine avoid the necessity to prove that there was a contract? Well, the answer is not at all. Proving the contract is absolutely essential and part performance won't do it by itself. We have to prove there was a contract before we even get to the question of part performance. And part performance is a substitute for the writing, not a substitute for proof of the existence of a contract. In fact, an oral contract still has to be proved even if we are going to use the part performance doctrine. Some courts will even say it's got to be proved by clear and convincing evidence. If there's no writing, we want really strong evidence of an oral nature that there really was a contract. Well, that completes video number 37 about the statute of frauds and part performance. In our next video, number 38, we'll talk about the quality of title that a purchaser is entitled to receive under a real estate sale contract. If you have questions or comments, email profdale01 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, 